Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion Show are brought to you by Addy Sugar Shack, located at 6201 Northwest Expressway in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the parking lot of Tenjo. Addy Sugar Shack specializes in unique and delicious shaved ice treats and bonus hot treats on the weekends. Come by Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. through 9 p.m., Saturday from noon to 7 p.m., and Sunday noon through 5 p.m. Get your cold sugar fix today. Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show, and today I'm here with my state senator, Ron Sharp, who represents the 17th District here in Oklahoma. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Honored to meet you, sir. All right. It's nice meeting you, too. Um, First question I have is, where are you from and where did you grow up at? Well, I was born here in Shawnee, Oklahoma, At uh, uh, actually born in my home. Uh, I was born a little bit premature and uh, just a few blocks from Shawnee City Hospital, but Dr. Paramore delivered me and uh, I've lived here in Shawnee basically all my life, except for just four years we lived in Oklahoma City uh, when they were building I-40 and my dad was appointed Director of Agriculture of Oklahoma. And then the second they got uh, I-40 completed, we moved back here to Shawnee. This has been my home, and that's where my dad loved to live. And so he was a Choctaw Indian from uh, Calera, Oklahoma, and was appointed uh, to serve in agriculture. And then, of course, he moved up the ladder to finally become his last few years in office uh, as the director. All right, that's cool. Um, So what made you want to become a teacher? Well, it's kind of by accident, uh, about three days before Shawnee Public School started up, they lost their tennis coach. Curtis Richmond decided to go be a pro in Tulsa, and the superintendent of schools contacted my dad when I'm out playing tennis, about to go to law school, and uh, said they wanted to offer me the job. So my dad told me when I got home from playing tennis, while you're out playing tennis, I got your job. And I really never intended to get into public school teaching. I thought that I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, That's all that I really wanted to be. I'd studied law pretty intently. But uh, once I got into public school teaching, and of course I worked for a little bit for the DA's office there in Oklahoma County, and I realized that being a public school teacher, a tennis coach, was where I really wanted to be, and I thought that's where the good Lord wanted me to be. All right. School. So what made you run for the state senate? Well, I was actually asked by several residents. Uh, my good friend Charlie Laster had the job before me. Uh, it was becoming more and more of a full-time job as our population grew, as the complexities of our government began to grow with Uh, whether you're talking about Medicaid or whether you're talking about uh, transportation projects. People were expecting more and more of their legislators. Uh, Charlie had two kids about to go to college, and this was taking up, I think, more time than what he really wanted to, at that time, uh, put forth. And so, basically, the conversation started out with uh, me and a few people, and they said, as actively involved, in public education, understanding that public education was under attack, that someone who had helped create the funding formula back in the 1980s for our education system, I knew that very well. Uh, I also, of course, understood agriculture because my dad had been in agriculture. Uh, I had worked with uh, various projects here in Shawnee with the Jail Trust Authority. I had served on that original board that created our Pottawatomie County Jail Trust, so I knew exactly how that worked. So the various areas that I had been able to work for, uh, I thought I could help the citizens of Oklahoma and my district uh, in the legislature. All right. Um, So what was one of your favorite things you were a part of uh, during your time in the state legislature? The, I had several bits of information that I wanted to get to legislation and that was of course one is to make our budget much more transparent to the public so I am responsible for authoring the uh, performance informed budgeting and transparency act of 2015 of which now you can get on the internet and of course it depends on the layers that you want to go through but you can get to the complete understanding of our budget now it's 
any budget, whether it's education, transportation, is going to take hours of which to look at. It's not just going to be in front of you because there's so many different layers, like peeling an onion. And so, you know, some people want that information just in front of you, but you can't do that because there's federal, there's state funds, there's county money, which is involved. But if you're ready to spend the time, every single dollar of taxpayer uh, revenue can be, and expenditures can be examined if you're ready which to spend the time. That's why there can be no graft and corruption, as many people want to assert, uh, that that's impossible because we are now to the point of which we can account for every single dollar. And of course, I feel very fortunate to have ran that legislation. Uh, so the entire budget is based on legislation I offered. Uh, I also authored legislation of which to create the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, math for our uh, all of our public schools. That's my legislation of which I ran. So, uh, and it took quite a bit of effort to get it through. The governor was very close to vetoing that because she was of the opinion it had a uh, physical impact and we were able to show her that this would be the responsibility of the career techs and our schools uh, would create their, the uh, STEM regions and the STEM communities as they have right now. So all these, when you see these kids going to these STEM uh, projects, robotics, that's my legislation of which I ran. Very, uh, very proud of that legislation. And also, uh, I realized as a parent who had went through a divorce that there was no teeth in the child visitation schedule. So I ran legislation of which very similar to filling out a, a small claims. You don't have to have a lawyer anymore if your wife or husband is not giving you visitation rights. Uh, you can now go down, fill out a form, show exactly where the dates that you were to get visitation and you can now enforce that without having to have a lawyer. When you're having to pay child support and you're having to pay for your own uh, you know, use of home and so forth, rent, whatever, you don't have the money. So, and of course the police, the sheriff's department, no one was there to enforce visitation. And you lose that relationship with your son or daughter after just a few weeks of not getting to see them. And you've got to keep that going. So I ran that legislation. And of course it's, it's one of which other states are copying today. Uh, it was too late for me but it was hopefully now uh, not too late for episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who were more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization that's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. For the fathers and the mothers who have visitation schedules can now get the visitation rights without losing contact and without the other spouse poisoning that child. All right, that's good. Um... During your time in the legislature, the Republican Party held control in both the House and the Senate and the governorship. During this time, there was also a decrease in funding for education until 2018 when the teacher strike happened. Uh, why do you think so many elected officials within your party disagree with funding public education? There is a idea among the conservatives that public education is, is not providing children a proper education. That is their philosophy. That is wrong. Uh, we are doing the best job ever in public education with educating our top students. 
whether it's in calculus, trigonometry, English, American history, government, our top kids are doing better than ever. The problem is we have a lower tier primarily caused by divorce, economic reasons that are slipping through the cracks. And it is impossible for us until we are able to find solutions to our dysfunctional families to correct that. Education is a three-tiered system where it's very similar to a pyramid where it takes the child, the teacher, and the parent are all points of that pyramid. And if any point is not providing the child a proper education, if the parent is not encouraging the child, if the teacher is not doing their job, and if the child is not coming into the classroom prepared of which to learn, then all education breaks down. We are educating every single child that comes through that door. We're, we're having uh, fetal drug syndrome in our public schools today, fetal alcohol syndrome, just again, divorce. Our children are so problematic in trying to figure out themselves with all the problems that they face today. Many of our children today don't even know they're going to get a meal within hours, and they're hungry. And then, of course, to stretch food out, our parents are feeding their kids junk food, which is hardly uh, a good source to be in an educational environment. Having potato chips, french fries, they need three good meals a day, as anyone will tell you, in order for you to function well and to feel well. So uh, it is very problematic. Uh, they also realize that there is money in charter schools. So the worst that they can make a public school look, the more attraction there is to a charter school. There is no indication that charter schools are doing any better than our public schools, but there's money in it. And that is where the money that was used to defeat me in this last election came from charter schools. Uh, to make sure that they're getting, because there's a generally about a 10% uh, revenue profit for every management company that runs that charter school. So they will spend thousands of which to make millions. And that's what they're doing now. There's also a sponsorship fee. And there's also a, uh, a uh, Oklahoma public charter school association that's making $7,500 off of every charter school. This is one money-making scheme. And for them, which to get this money, they have to make public schools look bad. And they are successfully able to do that. And so therefore, when you have someone that is not a public school teacher, they're being sold this bag of goods, how bad public schools are doing, not understanding that, again, every single child that walks through that door or not even able to walk through that door, we are trying to educate. We're having to even feed some kids uh, because of the fact that their disabilities. Uh, and again, when you have a child that's emotionally, mentally disturbed into your classroom, and that's what the designation is by a, uh, an, an IEP, and yet you're still doing your best of which to educate that child, which a charter school would never let into their school. And of course, these are, these are teachers in your charter schools. Most of them are not even certified. Yeah. So <clears throat> this, the public is being sold this bag of goods which is totally inaccurate. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, what was I about to say? Um, uh, I was going to um, also ask you about um, the email that was sent out before the election uh, from Epic, I think is who yes. it was. It said... Um, it was just letting people know that you were going to be on the ballot and whatnot. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, that's election fraud. Yeah. Uh, you, that is illegal under Oklahoma statutes to use a public domain paid for 
computers on school hours that was sent out during school hours to parents. Some of these parents were getting through their learning fund these computers provided through public money. So on both ends, that was being provided, and they are encouraging parents, and here we are in a pandemic. Many of our schools are not open yet because of the COVID crisis. They are attracted to Epic. They're getting a $1,000 learning fund, which they can use of which for singing lessons, for, for horseback riding, which I'm not certain under Oklahoma statute that is legal. That is what the state auditor is looking at right now. Uh, and then they will use that to say that Ron Sharp is dishonest. They sued me. The case was thrown out because it was meritless by the Oklahoma County judge. And then, of course, then they send out to parents who are now required or being forced to use virtual learning then to say that here he is they missed me in my name what you can't do under Oklahoma statute using public funds of which to promote a political election or to influence a political election using my specific name saying that I am dishonest and then encouraging parents to go out and vote uh, Again, that influences an election when you have a very low voter turnout. And this Senate District 17 race runoff was a very, very low voter turnout. Yeah. Now, again, I was defeated by 20% of the vote, but in a low voter turnout. And again, when you're looking at the number of people, that not only went out to Senate District 17 parents of EPIC, but it also went out to basically every single parent in the state of Oklahoma who had relatives, friends in Senate District 17. So it had a direct influence on this election when that was sent out just days before the election. You cannot legally do that. So the entire election was determined by fraud. And that is not fair of which to do that. Uh, again, that is yet to be determined as to whether, uh, by the state auditor, as to whether there are infractions of statutes being going on. That's why the governor called this audit to take place. For them to say that I am dishonest has yet to be determined. I can back up every single fact that I presented having either statutory problems or uh, 210, which is Oklahoma Administrative Code 210, or Oklahoma Administrative Code 777, which is the virtual charter schools, I can back up everything that I've said. Nothing that I have said has been refuted by either the State Department of Education or the statewide virtual charter school board. So therefore, if I am dishonest, show me one single example that I am dishonest. When I said that they moved kids from one school to another, they admitted to that. When the statewide virtual charter school executive uh, director said that Epic Blended cannot use the virtual attendance policy, that is what I said. When I said that the Epic had administrative cost that far exceeds the state limit of 5% when the one of the owners of Epic said that they had a 22% administration cost, he admitted under oath that they had violated our prohibition of the 5% cap. So therefore, show me one single example of which I have been dishonest. And yet they put that into an email to parents saying that Ron Sharp, by name, which is not to be done statutorily under Oklahoma ethics laws, and then, you know, to then say, then go out and vote. Uh, that is improper. And I would be ashamed to win an election having that type of problem in my election. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, how do you feel about 
uh, Shane Jett and his ability to possibly uh, legislate in favor of charter schools or against um, uh, public education, do you think that he's going to be you know, all the way in favor of charters? How do you feel about that? That is what we're going to have to determine. Uh, I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But he acknowledged in his Senate campaign biography that he is a member of the Dove Charter Science Academy, which is a charter school that has been under investigation for embezzlement. I am concerned about that uh, as to what I wouldn't serve on such a board which is under investigation and has been under investigation for embezzlement here in the state of Oklahoma. And Gary Jones, who was the state auditor, proved that the Dove School had embezzled money up into the millions. I would not serve on such a board. I am a public school advocate. I am a product of public schools. Therefore, I would place my children into public schools. I have faith in our public schools. He does not do so. He does not educate his children into our public schools. So I would be concerned about his support for public schools because from 93 to 96 percent of our parents must send their children to a public school. The funding formula is geared toward public schools. So if you want to, in the state of Oklahoma, homeschool your child, if you feel competent in doing so, you should have that opportunity. If you want to send your child to a private school, you should have that opportunity. But most parents cannot afford to send their child to a private school. There's not even one available in their community, most of our rural communities. Secondly, they don't provide busing. Uh, they don't provide the food. You have to pay for the tuition. The average cost of a private school tuition is $8,000 a semester. So therefore, that is impossible uh, for them to do that. Most parents have to work, both have to work, or they're single parents. So they must send their child to a public school. You do not want to divert money going to a public school to a private school organization. You should have that opportunity. I believe in education choice. You can either send your child to a free public school or homeschool your child or send your child to a public school, but that's at your expense. All right. Uh, so now that you'll be out of office come 2021, what do you plan on doing within the next few years? Do you think you'd run for office again? Uh, I'm definitely not ruling that out. I have four more years that I can serve. I have all this institutional knowledge of the education funding formula. The transportation department is concerned that I'm not going to be there to help them understand to other legislators the bonding of capital bonds used in that and of course the federal funding that's involved. The health department is concerned because I understand their budget problems because it's 80-20 grants if you cut the health department 5-10% here in the state of Oklahoma, they must return a, the reciprocity of that money back to the federal. You just can't cut transportation, education, and health care because they are generally at 80, 20, whatever kind of grant. So whatever you, they lose in state funding, they are required of which to return that reciprocal amount back to the federal government because you must provide your percentage. Uh, the same is true, for instance, we just passed Medicaid expansion uh, on in, in, in June 30th. Well, we must, we must, by our Constitution, now provide 10% of that money. If we can't provide that 10%, we are out of federal statute. So that must be explained to legislators that you do not have the options of which to come in and just say we're going to change everything up. We're going to we're going to change this discretionary spending. Uh, you don't have that option. We must provide school teacher pay salaries. There are certain things that we have to do because we've obligated ourselves to do that. And one of the things of which 
was very disturbing to me as a legislator is, is the one of our legislators came up, we're going to run a resolution of which to require the federal government to balance the budget. Well, as a 38-year government teacher, resolutions carry no weight of law. They don't even leave the power of the state of Oklahoma. If you're wanting to, as a state, request the federal government, the U.S. Congress, of which to balance the budget, you must follow what is called a, a memorial. So this was entirely a political ploy of which I'm not going to lie to my public and say, well, I voted of which to require the federal government balance the budget. We just increased Medicaid expansion. We have to have that 90% of that money coming from the federal government, which we know they don't have. We have, we just assumed $3.2 trillion of additional debt for our COVID-19 problems. Uh, we have to have a uh, military of which to provide, and we have money that is neither backed by gold or silver since 1971. So therefore, as long as the average business accepts your dollar bills, it basically it is irrelevant as to whether that money is balanced or not, unfortunately. Uh, you would deflate your economy down to nothing if you had a balanced budget amendment basically based on monopoly money. That's what people don't understand. So uh, how we have survived since 1971 is totally on the good faith and credit of the United States of America. But to now try to put that back, to put the genie back into the bottle uh, is impossible. Yes, we have now a 25 to 26 trillion dollar debt, but technically the Congress could write one bill saying here is a 26 trillion dollar bill, the debt is paid off. And technically using this fiat money, which is not backed by gold or silver, you could technically do that. And two-thirds of that debt we owe to ourselves. So you're sitting there thinking, well, how do, and of course, uh, when you have China and you have Britain and Japan that's all invested, they're still accepting American dollars, you're discussing a problem that really does not exist based on the fact that your money is not backed by gold or silver. Is there going to be a reckoning day to this? When, when, but that's going to be a confidence problem in our system. And if we, the government actually did balance the budget, we would be in trouble here in the state of Oklahoma because our transportation projects, again, our Medicaid expansion, we wouldn't have the money to pay for all this. We can't print up money. The problems would probably result in the entire destruction of the United States as we exist today. These are legislators who do not understand what they're doing by even making this suggestion, and they're basically decepting, deceptive to the public when you run a resolution where it carried no weight of law. And, I'm, and I can't do that. I'm a government teacher. I'm not, I can't go back. I could go back to my public and say, boy, I voted for this resolution of which to require the U.S. Congress balance the budget but again, we knew that the public by polls was going to vote for Medicaid expansion. I can't do that. I would rather lose an election than have to live with the fact that I lied to my constituents. All right. Um, and um, last question I have here is what kind of music do you listen to? Well, I like the old 70s and 80s music. Uh, where I can understand it, they, you know, that's always something which uh, any senior citizens will say. They know that they've lost touch with the younger generation when they can't understand their music. Uh, I can't even understand the words of the music today. I've tried to listen to it just to see that I can, if I can adapt. But I like the old, particularly 60s, but really the 70s and 80s music because I can understand it. I like country western music. Uh, I don't like any obscenities uh, in any music, so 
and I have a concern today whenever we're, our younger generation is listening to music that is basically racist. My family were never racist. Uh, but again, I don't even like to listen to, even if it's the race themselves criticizing their own race, I don't like that because that puts things into my mind saying, well, why am I not racist? When you're mistreating women, when you're talking about women being, you know, and I, I don't go for that. So any music that promotes something that violates my Christian values, I'm not going to listen to. I believe in the old Zig Ziglar and the Bible input output if you put bad things into your brain you get bad things out if i don't listen to cussing then when i get mad i don't curse and so uh and if we're going to get rid of racism if we're going to get rid of uh, uh gender problems then we cannot be in any way listening to something on one hand saying don't do this this and this and yet we're listening to music that is promoting that so I like the old music where it's the Barry Band lows and the, uh, you know, all the, of course, my cousins were all in Toby Keith's band. So it was my uh, cousin, Scott Webb, whose daughter died of brain cancer, Allie, Allison Faith Webb. And, of course, Toby Keith created the Allie's House. So I'm very partial to Toby Keith and to Bread that music there, and of course to Ambrosia. So, of course, I went to college with uh, Reba McIntyre. Oh, okay. So I know her very well. Used to be in the student union with her quite often when she came in there with her husband at that time. So, uh, you know, I just, that's the kind of music that I like. I like music that I can understand the words that gives me a good feeling of life, that up, up, uplifts me to, to life. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, where can we find you on social media? Well, I'm still going to be on Facebook. Uh, I have not discarded the possibility of running again for public office, perhaps even the Senate seat four years from now. Uh, I think that I can do a service to my constituents. I th I've had more construction projects in Senate District 17 than any other senator, whether it's the Turnpike, now the Kickapoo Turnpike, that's that 22 miles is totally in my district from I-44, the Turner Turnpike, to I-40. We are six-laning I-40. I have continued through the Transportation Department to fund uh, county improvement on roads and bridges. Uh, we are moving money to improve our county roads the Transportation Department, the Turnpike Authority will, I'm sure, very openly admit that I have been very proactive in my district in getting these funds. Public schools, I have made sure that they are completely funded. Uh, the Health Department comes to me, explains to me their problems. I've been able to explain to my Senate and House colleagues the necessity of funding uh, our health department, so I feel like I can perform a service. Have I felt like that this, you know, the defeat has lifted a burden from me? Yes. Uh, but do I feel a responsibility as a 38-year government teacher of not only U.S. government but also Oklahoma government? Do I understand the how a bill becomes a law here in Oklahoma? Do I understand that you must treat these agency people who work for our state of Oklahoma with respect and kindness because they are performing a function. I don't act like I'm a powerful human being. I've tried to use my ability of which to enact laws, to, to provide budgeting, to make sure that uh, my citizens benefit and the entire state of Oklahoma benefits from my knowledge. So that's why I would consider running again if my health is in good shape four years from now. Uh, it's, I'm not making that determination yet, but if the, if I am good health, I will certainly consider running again. All right. Thanks.